Hello everyone. In this video I will discuss one of the films called Pandemonium, and never forget that I always pray for you and your family to be happy and healthy always. The story begins by showing a man who wakes up in the middle of the road, realizing that he has just been in an accident, and fortunately survived. At the same time, another man appears, the motorcyclist who was hit. Although initially puzzled, both men are essentially unharmed. For some reason, the motorcyclist doesn't seem happy, even though his body is completely uninjured. He suggests they try to recall the last moments before the accident to figure out what happened. In the midst of their confusion, the motorcyclist reveals that they have left the world of the living. He theorizes that he died first because he had been there for several minutes. Nathan, the man who woke up in the road, initially denies this but finds no other plausible explanation. Still in disbelief, Nathan goes to check on his wrecked car and is shocked to see his own body inside. He becomes distressed, thinking about his children and friends who will be left behind. Daniel, the motorcyclist, mentions his own worried wife and regrets buying the motorcycle that caused his demise. He also wonders why Nathan doesn't seem to miss his wife or the mother of his children. Nathan continues to panic, but Daniel is unfazed and talks about death and the afterlife, describing it as peaceful. To convince Nathan, Daniel drags Nathan's body out of the car and covers its face with a handkerchief. At that moment, a car approaches, and Nathan desperately hopes the driver will call an ambulance, as he doesn't want to die and thinks his body might still be saved. However, the driver does something despicable. Instead of helping, he steals money from Nathan's wallet. Nathan now has no choice but to accept the reality that he is a wandering spirit or ghost, and he wonders if judgment is imminent. At this moment, Nathan admits to ending his wife's life, but swears it was an act of mercy. Before he can explain further, Daniel suddenly hears peaceful, melodious music, and with it appears a white door. Snow covers the entire area. Daniel swears he hears music coming from the white door, but Nathan hears nothing. Curious, they both start to approach the white door, but suddenly a red door appears behind them. Nathan hears terrifying screams from the red door, but this time Daniel hears nothing. They conclude that the white door leads to heaven while the red door leads to hell. This indicates that Nathan will be punished for killing his wife. Panicking, Nathan continues explaining that his wife was seriously ill and he only intended to end her suffering. Daniel admits he has no right to judge and only wants to walk through the white door to reach heaven. However, Nathan's efforts are futile because everything has been predetermined and Nathan should have behaved better if he wanted to receive something good in return. Nathan realizes this and immediately apologizes for the accident as he unintentionally ran over Daniel. Daniel forgives him, admitting it wasn't entirely Nathan's fault because he was distracted by a little girl playing by the roadside. The two men hug and say their final goodbyes, but despite several attempts, Daniel still cannot enter the white door and the music fades from his hearing, replaced by the terrifying screams. Suddenly another voice is heard from behind them and a little girl appears, indicating that the girl Daniel saw earlier had also died. The girl mentions that a motorcycle hit her. With no choice but to confess, Daniel admits he was heavily drunk and insisted on driving, prompting Nathan to assert that it wasn't an accidental death, but rather Daniel's carelessness that killed an innocent child. After a brief argument, the two men try to guide the little girl to the white door, hoping to enter together. However, the little girl refuses to go with strangers and starts screaming. Despite their efforts, the men cannot stop her screams until Daniel forcibly picks her up and throws her through the white door, which surprisingly works. Afterwards, they realize it's now their time to enter the red door, which has been open all along. Daniel, feeling hesitant, admits he needs a little push or force. Nathan has no objections and is happy to help. Now it's Nathan's turn to feel unsure. He tries to explain again what he did to his wife and wonders what would happen if he refused to enter or if he wanted to remain in the world. Suddenly, a terrifying creature appears, waiting for Nathan to step through the door. Elle était dépressive, elle aimait pas sa vie. Moi, j'ai pas envie. 
Però è qua. Nathan then arrives in hell, where he sees thousands of souls lying helplessly. Not far from where he stands, he finds the little girl, which shocks him to his knees. When he reaches for her hand, he has a vision of her background. The girl is named Jeanne, and she is followed by a terrifying shadow resembling a plant wherever she goes. Sleeplessness is not new to Jeanne because her parents are always fighting. Her mother wants to help Jeanne while her father avoids her out of fear and believes they should be protected from her. Tired of all this, Jeanne gets out of bed, leaves her music box open and starts playing. She eventually checks the window, where there is a large tree that she often uses as an outlet. Jeanne then goes downstairs to get a snack and sees her parents still arguing about her. She decides to make her own snack, spreading jam on a slice of bread, and seems pleased with the knife she is holding. The scene then shifts to show a recording where Jeanne is being interviewed by her therapist. She tells the woman how she killed a mother bird trying to protect its young and admits that she also enjoyed torturing her sister with a pen out of hatred. Jeanne even confesses that she once considered harming her parents while they slept. Since then, her parents locked Jeanne in her room every night. The therapist wants to discuss in more detail what Jeanne did to her sister, but Jeanne refuses and remains silent. The scene returns to the house the next morning, showing Jeanne at the dining table demanding breakfast, but no one comes. A few minutes later, Jeanne is seen leaving the kitchen, enjoying some cereal. Nearby, her mother and father lie lifeless on the floor. She approaches them to make sure they are truly dead, then kisses her mother and says goodbye. Jeanne then makes more bread with jam and goes to the basement, which oddly looks like a large cave. She gives the food to her friend Tony, the monster, accusing him of killing her parents. Tony denies it. After Tony eats, Jean invites him upstairs because now that her parents are gone, Tony can live in a better place. As they walk around, Tony marvels at the beauty and warmth of the sun, something he has never experienced before. Jeanne then takes him to the bathroom and teaches him how to clean himself. Sometime later, Tony is seen clean and dressed neatly. Jeanne asks him to help move her parents' bodies, but before that, she reveals she wants to give them a final offering. Jeanne imagines performing a play on a stage with the audience cheering loudly. She tells a story about waking up one day with no breakfast, which elicits laughter from the audience. Then she executes Tony for his crimes. Tony denies again that he killed anyone and says he has no memory of his existence before appearing in the cave. But Jean doesn't care about that at all. While Tony places the mother's corpse under the bed, Jeanne plays happily on the mattress, reminiscing about how she used to disturb her parents while they slept. Next, Tony puts the father's body in the same place, and when they get hungry, they both admit they can't cook. Jeanne, however, can prepare cereal and bread for them to eat. At the same time, they hear a doorbell ring. Jeanne opens the door to find a package delivery man, who says he needs an adult signature for the delivery. Jeanne calls for Tony, but since there is no response, the delivery man says he'll come back another day. Desperately, Jeanne searches for Tony, who hasn't been answering. Downstairs, she sees frightening drawings she had created over the years. When she returns to her parents' bedroom, Jeanne finally finds Tony, eating her parents' bodies. The scene then shifts to Jeanne burning all her toys. She also approaches her younger sister, who is drawing, and tells her that Tony is now hungry. Jeanne then takes her sister and does something unexpected to her, all while singing happily as she leaves her sister behind. C'est Tony qui l'a tué. Tony a faim. Il va me tuer aussi. Oui. Tu vas être bien là-dedans. Allez, entre là-dedans, tu sentiras rien. Back in hell, Nathan shudders in horror at these memories and decides to crawl away. He then finds a teenage girl with her mother. Nathan touches their hands and memories of the mother and daughter flood his mind. He sees the mother, named Julia, holding back tears and calling out to her daughter who doesn't respond. 
Julia then notices dried bloodstains on the table. As she tries to clean them, she feels even worse. Julia then goes to the bathroom and pulls her daughter, Chloe, out of a blood-filled bathtub. Chloe, allez, viens. Je suis le garagiste depuis que j'ai eu au boulot. <laughs> she continues to cry over Chloe as she drags her body to the dining table. Julia serves breakfast for both of them and starts talking about their plans for a vacation together. A flashback shows the morning before, where Julia scolds Chloe for taking too long in the bathroom because they were both running late. They had breakfast together, but Julia was on the phone arguing with a colleague about work while Chloe glaring at a knife. Chloe was haunted by the mistreatment from her classmates at school, which made her life miserable. When it was time to leave, Chloe tried to explain that she couldn't handle it anymore and wanted to transfer to another school. Julia attempted to comfort Chloe, but came off as dismissive and belittling. Even after seeing Chloe's tears, Julia thought her daughter was overreacting, leaving Chloe unsure how to explain her problems to her mother. The scene then shifts to the present, showing Chloe's lifeless body with a cat licking her wounds. This angers Julia, who chases the cat away. She puts Chloe in a wheelchair, ignoring the ringing phone, and decides to go on vacation while holding back tears. As she packs clothes and covers Chloe's body, Julia expresses her love, admitting she wasn't always there for her daughter. Julia tells Chloe she can leave school and that she will arrange for homeschooling. When she opens the door to leave, Julia is shocked to see a wall instead of the outside. This triggers a memory of Chloe being bullied by other students in the school bathroom. They humiliated and treated her cruelly, with one student even recording the incident to post on social media. Back in the present, a neighbor woman arrives, saying she heard screaming and was worried something had happened. Julia, panicking, says they are going on vacation and tries to end the conversation. However, the neighbor senses something is wrong and forces her way in, shocked at Chloe's condition. A few moments later, Julia is shown driving with Chloe's corpse beside her. She cries, reminiscing about Chloe's birth and her promise to give her a better life. Julia pleads with Chloe to respond, and finally accepting that Chloe is gone, she closes Chloe's eyes, losing focus and causing an accident. After the flashback of Chloe's death, Julia wakes up to find emergency responders helping her while others retrieve Chloe's body, assuming she died in the accident. They place Chloe in a body bag. Back in hell, after covering Chloe and Julia's bodies, Nathan feels exhausted from witnessing the tragedies of the damned souls. Soon, a creature appears, identifying itself as a guide, not anyone important, aiming to lead Nathan to his punishment. Nathan tries again to explain his wife's suffering from multiple sclerosis, a disease where the immune system attacks nerves. The creature, named Norgal, asks Nathan a critical question. Did Nathan's wife ask to be killed? Nathan remains silent, so he must face his punishment as Norgal clarifies that judgment is not its role. Norgal leads Nathan to another area, explaining that the first step in eternal torment is isolation, meant to erase memories of previous lives, cleansing souls of suffering and despair. Nathan enters a dark room filled with scattered people. Norgal says isolation lasts for 40 centuries or 4,000 years, a mere prelude to the suffering ahead. Nathan tries to protest, but Norgal leaves and the door vanishes. Suddenly a blanket cloth or sack in the room's corner moves, revealing Billy, who immediately sees Nathan as a new toy and attacks without hesitation. When Nathan stops moving, Billy screams in frustration. The destruction of Nathan's soul results in his reincarnation. A scene shows a mother giving birth to a healthy baby, while Norgul explains that Billy accidentally sent a sinful soul back to the human world, creating people who rise against God. Norgul punishes Billy by beheading him, noting that Billy's body will regrow by tomorrow, allowing him to visit the human world. Billy's new task is to retrieve Nathan's soul, and with that, the story ends. And that's it for the story series of this film. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to support this channel by subscribe, like, and share. See you in the next video. Goodbye.